Today we're going to be preaching about one of the most popular and quotable verses from the Bible. You'll see it on the screen here in just a moment. I want us to actually go ahead and say it together. All right? Let's say this verse together. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. Now, unfortunately, this verse is so often ripped out of context and given various meanings. Uh, For instance, many believe it to mean that Christians have the power to do anything they desire. That's not what it means. Some seem to interpret it to mean I can do impossible things if I attach Christ's name to it. I recently read a post by another Southern Baptist pastor who said this, obviously being facetious, but he said, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. Well, I hope we can at least come to the conclusion that Paul certainly doesn't mean that we have the license to sin. In other words, I can do and then fill in the blank through Christ who strengthens me. Just anything we want to. That's not what Paul has in mind in this verse. But I also hope that we can debunk the idea that we can just try anything and then affix this verse to a bumper sticker on our car, post it on our Facebook page, wear a t-shirt with a verse on it, or even get a tattoo of the verse and then claim the power of Christ for whatever whatever it is we're going to do. We need to understand this verse in its context and then apply it to our lives. So we're in Philippians. I want you to turn there because we will be looking at the context. Verses preceding Philippians 4.13 and on the other side of that verse as well. Now this message today is the fourth in a series of sermons. I know we had a little break because I was out of town. But uh, the fourth in a series of certain messages from the book of Philippians. And as we find Paul writing this letter, he's in prison. Uh, We also know that this letter points to his relationship with the church in Philippi. He had a relationship with that church as one of, of friendship and one of mutual support and partnership in the gospel and the spread of the gospel particularly. We also know that the church in Philippi had supported Paul financially. We read about it in 2 Corinthians around chapter 8. And we know that 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 occurred about 10 years before Paul wrote this book to the Philippians, which oddly enough wrote this letter in conjunction with receiving another financial gift from that church. So I want you to look there in chapter 4, and we get a sense of what's going on here, that he's uh, not only highlighting his relationship with the church, but he's actually giving thanks um, for the gift that he's received. So look at verse 10 of Philippians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn there to the book of Philippians, the fourth chapter, and look there at verse 10, where it says, Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So he's kind of thinking about that window of time, almost 10 years between those gifts. Then skip down to verse 14. And look what 14 says. Paul's saying here, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So Paul here is rejoicing. He's giving thanks, not according to his needs, 
but because of their giving spirit and their partnership with him. Ultimately, Paul's joy and contentment is rooted in God, not in his circumstances, whether in need or in want, or whether in plenty or in abundance, as we will see. Today in this message, I want you to get this main idea. And the main idea is this, that in Christ, we have strength to embrace God's will. I want us to get this main idea that we will find that in Christ we have strength to embrace God's will for us. In fleshing this out today, we will see three things. We're going to see uh, the secret of being content. We're going to see the ability to be content. And we're going to talk about the strength to be content. So first of all, we want to talk about the secret the secret to being content. Uh, the fact is that Paul had to be taught contentment. He had to be taught contentment. Look there in verse 11, what it says. So Paul here, speaking about how they had given this gift and how he's rejoiced in that gift. And verse 11 says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am, to be content. Now this year, our students will be going to school and they will be taught by a teacher. And so when Paul says he learned something, I am assuming that somebody had to teach him. In this case, that somebody is none other than God himself. He says, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have, here it is again, learned the secret. He's learned the secret, which means he must have been taught the secret. He learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. Throughout Paul's life, he faced Many troubles. Matter of fact, if you look in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, listen, listen to how Paul recalls some of the hardships he faced in his life. He says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger uh, from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without water. in cold and exposure. And he says, beyond all those things, I had the daily pressures that I faced from the churches that he ministered to. So throughout his, his life, he faced great hardship. But life for Paul was not all hardship. I know we get the idea because we look at scriptures and we see all the things he's been through, imprisonment, and, and I mean, he writes this in prison. But I think we would have to say that in Paul's life, he had some mountains as well as valleys. Take, for instance, on the road to Damascus. Who did he see? Jesus! I'd call that a mountaintop experience, wouldn't you? I would say he mapped that out as the highlight of his life. Okay, so, and we know that he would spend years in a place, and he would often see great Numbers of people come to faith. And he would disciple them in the gospel. And he did, I mean, take somebody like, like Lydia in, the, in, in Acts, who had means and who was able to help finance and help and support. My guess is that in that season of Paul's life, he probably had exactly what he needed. He may have had more than enough. But the point is this. God was teaching Paul through all of those things the secret of being content. 
And you know, sometimes it's harder to be content when we have much than when we have little. Let me share a quote from C.H. Spurgeon from this old Baptist preacher. He said, it is probably easier to know how to go down than to know how to go up. And from his own experience, Spurgeon said this, How many Christians have I seen grandly glorifying God in sickness and poverty and when they have come down in the world? And how often have I seen other Christians dishonoring God when they grow rich or when they have risen to a position of influence among their fellow man? Paul was taught how to be content in both of those scenarios. Brought low, brought high, it didn't matter. Contentment was not found in the lows or the highs or anything in between. God taught Paul that circumstances were not to determine Paul's contentment and joy. So Paul says there when he's talking to those Philippians, and, and for some who have read this, they think, well, this is kind of smug of Paul, right? I mean, he gets this gift. Epaphrodite, I mean, just think about it. Epaphrodite brings him this gift. And Paul's saying, thank you, but I really didn't need it. Now, how would you like to get a thank you note like that? Thank you for your gift, and I really didn't need it. I want you to know that I actually didn't need it at all. That's why, by the way, Paul goes back into this. Is a, he digresses into this point. He's teaching, instructing them what he's been taught. Then he goes on to say, yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. He wants to understand. It's not that I'm uh, uh, ungrateful. I'm very grateful. But you need to understand that God has taught me that whether Epaphroditus brought me this financial gift or not, I would sit here in this prison cell and I would have contentment and joy in the Lord. Paul could have complained about his prison. He could have listed his needs. Thank you for your gift. Now let me give you three other things that I could use while I'm here in prison. That's not what he did. Paul's concern was not for his temporary comfort, but for their eternal good and God's eternal glory. Paul learned the secret of being content because he was in God's school of contentment. The secret of contentment must be taught. It must be taught. This week and in the following weeks, our children will go back to school. I wonder how many of you who are adults, it'd be interesting to ask you guys, how many of you liked school? Did you enjoy school? Yeah, some of you are like, I see some of this and see some of that. No. Some of us liked school so much we went back to college and beyond, okay? But others have foregone formal college education and have been educated in what is known as the school of hard knocks. That's right. How many of you have a degree from the school of hard knocks? All right, great. Praise God. You know, life can be, can be hard. And we see that in Paul's life. But life can also be good, isn't it? It's not all hard knocks in life. There's an ebb and flow. But God often teaches us through bringing us through a variety of circumstances. None of us are immune from being in need. All of us have experienced sickness and loss. Life is not usually just these, though. Not just what we might call bad circumstances. We can point to times of plenty where we had what we needed or even more than we needed. And it's God's will that we face all manner of circumstances in life. And he is teaching us in those circumstances. I want you to think about that. He is teaching us in those circumstances. Some of you that are here today are going through some stuff. Good, bad, ugly, whatever. God is teaching you in those circumstances. You might say, hey, things are going good. I like these circumstances. Well, I like it when he teaches me this way. 
Some of you are going through some hard stuff and you're going, I don't want to be taught this lesson. But no matter what, God is teaching you how to be content, not in those things, but in Him. The question is whether we'll receive this teaching from God. I wonder today, have you been taught the secret of being content? Have you been taught the secret of being content? But not only do we find the secret of contentment that must be taught, but we also see here the ability to be content must be learned. Paul's made that clear, right? He said, I have learned. So he must have been taught, but he also learned something, and we need to understand what that means. The ability to be content must be learned. We are not wired, by the way, to be content. We're not. I mean, I realize that when we often talk about this, personality comes into it, right? You know, some people tend to be glass half full, and other people tend to be glass half empty. Our personality kind of comes into play with how we see things in life and how they come at us. But this is not really what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about our personality traits and our own ability to be content. Paul says here, I can do. That's a declaration of ability, isn't it? I can do. It's also a statement of independence. Uh, The word that is used in the Greek is one that the the Stoic philosophers use to declare their self-sufficiency. And Paul's saying, I can do. We are not to be dependent on our circumstances, our Joy and contentment is not to be tied to our circumstances, whether pleasant or difficult, when it comes to being content as Christians. So Paul is speaking of ability. I can do. But what is it that we need to learn to do? I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul is saying here, I am able to endure hardship without anxiety. I am able to receive earthly gain without pride. I am able to have joy and contentment when I have all that I need. And I am able to have joy and contentment when it doesn't seem like I have anything that I need. He's also saying this. I am able to withstand the temptation To complain, we don't have any complainers in here, do we? I am going to, I am able to withstand the temptation to complain in sickness and in poverty and whatever need I may have. And I am able to withstand the temptation to boast when I have more than enough. When I'm standing on the mountaintop. Ultimately, the ability is our faith. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. It is our faith. The doing here is trusting Christ completely in all situations. When we are not content and do not have joy, guess what? It's a faith problem that we have. It's a faith problem. Have you learned what it means to be content? Have you learned what it means to know how to be content? Paul is not saying, I cannot do all things. He's saying, I can do all things. I have learned that I'm able to endure and to receive all things. Content in every situation. So I wonder today, have you learned this have you learned this is there contentment and joy in your life or is there always this sense of I don't have enough or is there a sense of I'm good I got what I need because that's not contentment either Paul had mastered the art According to Charles Spurgeon, Paul had mastered the art of being hungry without murmuring, the art of being full without boasting, the art of suffering without impatience, 
the art of abounding without setting his affection on worldly things. See, we have to learn. We have to learn how to be content. The ability to be content is not something hardwired into us. We have to learn it. It comes only in Christ. And that brings us to the third, the third part of this equation. The strength to be content must be received. So see, we're being taught something through life, through our circumstances, good, bad, ugly, all in between. We're being taught something. And in that, we have to learn something. We have to learn that we are able to do, to endure, to go through, to step through, to accomplish the things that God lays in front of us. But we must understand this last thing. The strength to be content must be received. When Paul speaks of our ability, he's not making a statement about our ability to do things on our own. Paul is not pridefully saying, hey, I can do it all. I got this. I got this. I can do it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I can do all things through him who strengthens me or gives me strength. Paul's joy and contentment were not dependent on material support, whether it came from the Philippians or anyone else. He was grateful for it, but he was not dependent on it. Our contentment cannot come from earthly resources, but we do that, don't we? Why is it that when we seem to have enough or have more than enough, why is our happiness and joy and peace tied to that? Yeah, good question, isn't it? Why is it tied to that? Our contentment cannot come from these earthly resources. Some of you may say, yeah, well, Paul was a very strong man. And some of you have endured a lot of things, maybe sickness, maybe loss. And you've done it through internal, what we'd call internal fortitude. You're just somebody who, you just bear through it. But that's not, is that what Paul said? No, he's not saying that. He's not saying that his contentment came because he was uh, a strong person. Our contentment cannot come from these, but it must come from Christ's power and presence. Pressure from without can only be faced by having Christ's power within. This is why, I mean, the gospel is the power of God. I mean, unto salvation. I mean, in our culture today, we are so driven by trying to meet this expectation we have of what is the American dream of being secure and safe and having everything a certain way. We work our entire lives to try to reach this thing. But the gospel says, fooey on that thing. That thing you're trying to get, it's just passing by. And if you put all your, all your joy and contentment in having that thing, whatever it is, you will never be satisfied. You see, Paul was satisfied in Jesus. And the gospel it declares to us that in our own sinful nature, we come into this world and we're not wired to do things God's way, to want things God's way. We're wired to want things our own way. So that when we're a little child, we don't get our way, what do we do? <clears throat> Right? But the gospel says that that mm, is our resistance and our rebellion against a holy God who made us, who made us for worship, who made us for Him. And if God had just simply left us that way, we would never make it into His good graces. But by His grace... He sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. This Christ who can empower us, who can give us his presence, his, this strength 
to go through anything and still have the joy of the Lord. But it's not something that comes to us automatically. Listen here, this salvation that Christ brings to us is something that we must receive by faith. And so if you're here today and you say, well, I'd really like to be content and I'd really like to know joy. Well, the fact of the matter is that without Christ, it's impossible to have that contentment and joy. And if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I would say, come to faith in Christ. Turn to him before it's too late. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wash your sins away. He'll make you new through and through from the inside out. And he'll begin to teach you the secret of contentment and you'll learn the secret of contentment that you are able through the strength and power of Christ to do and endure all things for the name and fame of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul says it's Christ who gives him strength. And by the way, the force in the original language is the idea that it's not that, okay, Paul gets converted and he, sees, he receives this big boost of strength and and that's, that strength will do him through the end of his life. No, the idea here is, is that Christ will continually give him strength. I can do all things through Christ or through him who gives me strength. It's ongoing. It's an ongoing work of receiving God's gift of strength that gives us or enables us to be content in every situation. The context specifically points to material lack or material gain. But the principle extends further into the reaches of our everyday life. So when we say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, it certainly means that if you're having financial gain or financial loss, you can face all of that in the power of Christ for the glory of God. But we can extend it into our everyday lives. Whatever situation we find ourselves in, uh, whether with little or much, whether we are in hardship or prosperity, the secret to, con to contentment is bound up in the continual strength that Christ gives to those who are trusting in him. So it's kind of a strange thing here. Paul is saying, I've learned to be independent by being dependent on Christ. Independent from my circumstances by being dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's not easy to be dependent on someone, is it? Most of us don't like that. We like to be able to say, I can, I can do this, right? I remember several years back, um, around the year 2006 or 7, my father developed a terminal illness called, it's a, it's a long word, so hang with me here, it's called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, okay? It's the hardening of, of, of the lungs. And it was a strange disease that my father got because he never didn't smoke in his life. He didn't, wasn't around chemicals that normally would cause somebody to get this condition. But my father, he developed this condition. And it was terminal. And I, so I watched my father go. He was 56 at the time, I think. Uh, watched him go from being able to do pretty much everything to where he couldn't do hardly anything. I mean, he was dependent on oxygen all the time. He had to have oxygen with him. He became very dependent on my mother. I mean, she had to care for him. It's hard to watch someone go from being independent to being dependent. But here's the deal in the Christian life. If you really want to be independent of the circumstances that are around you, which ch tend to change all the time, don't they? Then we have to learn to be dependent, dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's His strength that makes the eye can do all things possible. His strength. Not our strength. So I wonder today, are you living in the strength of Christ? The clearest evidence of this is when we are no longer finding the basis for our joy and contentment 
in people, in things, but in Christ alone. So what's the source of your contentment? Is it knowing Christ? Is it following Christ? Is it loving Christ? Is it living for Christ? Or is it something else? Jesus said in the book of John, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For Philippians 4.13 is Paul saying this, I am enabled by Christ to do everything God wills, enduring it and prevailing over it through him who is strengthening me. And continually giving me strength. The whole point of this message is that Christ gives to us the strength to embrace God's will for us. Because ultimately, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we must receive it as from the Lord. I believe this passage has more to say about understanding God's will than anything else. Because we go through life and things happen to us and we start to wonder, what is this all about? We even ask questions, right? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me now? Why didn't this happen to me sooner? Right? When it comes to uh, good. Well, here's the deal. God is not surprised by our circumstances. Are you with me? God is not surprised by our circumstances. Your life today, your life five years ago, your life five, uh, ten years ago was a part of God's plan. And our future's in God's hand. And today you may be here and you may be facing the consequences of poor decisions. Or maybe even decisions that were made when you were trying to be content with things and people other than Christ. God is at work in that. He's teaching you. Maybe you're in a season of your life that feels pretty carefree. You might say, well, you know what? I have pretty much everything I need. Sometimes I have more than what I need. I can help other people. Well, praise God for that. But if your contentment is in that and not in God, there's a problem. God is at work in that too. God is in both. God's will covers being brought low and being lifted up. And God will give us nothing to do or nothing to experience that we cannot handle with his strength. That's why I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's the strength to embrace God's will. It's not, hey, I can live however I want to live. Because I can do all things through Christ. He's great to me. That's not what Paul was saying at all. His whole life was lived for God. God's power. God's purposes. God's plans. It's not that we can do whatever we want. It's that whatever we do for him can only be done through him. He gives us to do it. He puts it in front of us. Then he'll give us the power and strength to go through it. It doesn't matter whether it's our callings and giftings in terms of uh, life in, in the church, in our families, whatever it is that God has called you to do and to be, he gives you the strength to do that very thing, regardless of the circumstances. As we conclude here, let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that in the most discontented times in our life, when we're just kind of like not happy, we are often trying to find our joy and contentment in circumstances. Have you ever realized that? I mean, just step back for a second. Just step back. Look at a time in your life where there was, you're not happy, and think about what exactly you are going to be happy about. Wasn't it that, that job you wanted? 
Wasn't it that home you were trying to buy? Wasn't it that thing you wanted for your, for your family or for your spouse? Wasn't it something here? Isn't it true that when we're most unhappy, we're basing our happiness on things that are situational? And Paul tells us that we can find contentment and joy no matter what the circumstances are. And that is the point. Circumstances come and go. Oh, you'll be happy today. Everything's going grand. Wake up tomorrow morning and something's going to change. And, and somebody said, well, how are you doing? Oh, I ain't doing very good at all. Well, what happened? Yesterday you was like on top of the world. And Paul learned the secret to being content. And it's, it's not connected to any of those things. Our faith is not built upon the shifting winds of change that are a part of our lives. Our faith is built upon the unchanging power and presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we learn to rest fully in Him, then we will find that we have joy and that we are content in every situation and every season of our lives. Would you bow your heads? As we pray today, we ask you a question.